thank you very much, Seng Han, and thank you, Arthur, for uh, bringing this uh, conference together along with the other co-organizers. What I'd like to talk about this morning is uh, work that uh, I've been engaged with with my collaborators, Adam Brown and Moji Shokri and Zinni, uh, over the last three years on maybe the most elementary possible topic. Uh, as science progresses, it becomes possible to seek answers to increasingly infantile questions. And I think the most uh, basic thing to ask is why is there anything at all? And I don't think we're quite there yet, but what I want to discuss is the question, why is there more than one thing? Why do we appear to be in a universe with lots of interacting particles and objects? So in this talk, this will be a very unsophisticated talk. All Hilbert spaces are finite dimensional. Maybe when I learn more, they'll become infinite dimensional. The philosophy is that a naked Hilbert space with no tensor structure describes one particle with many, many states according to its dimension. And a Hilbert space in which a tensor decomposition has been fixed describes many particles, one for each tensor factor, and perhaps depending on the Hamiltonian and in interacting system of these particles. We will see a, a mechanism, a kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking at the operator level, whereby a naked Hilbert, Hilbert space dresses itself. That is, one thing becomes many. So I want to introduce the cast of characters in this talk. Again, these are very elementary objects that all of you manipulate in one form or another. And this is, of course, a toy model for our universe. Um, so the setting is we have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, Cn, where that very little n should be thought of as an enormous number. And we have its group of symmetries, the unitary group, Sun, simple Lie group. And we have its Lie algebra, the infinitesimal symmetries, little sun. And then getting slightly more interesting, we're going to consider metrics, gij, on the Lie algebra. But when we talk about the Lie algebra, I'm going to sneak in a factor of i and write its elements as Hermitian rather than skew Hermitian matrices to, be, to, to match the familiar Hamiltonians that physicists are manipulate. You're all familiar with the killing form. That's what it's called in mathematics or the L2 metric on SUN, where the norm squared of a vector is just the sum of the squares of its entries, entries of the matrix. But we'll be interested in metrics on the Lie algebra and hence left invariant metrics on the Lie group, which distinguish the different directions. They're, it's not adjoint invariant in my discussion. Certain directions will be many body, body directions, and these will be expensive to move in. Other directions will be small body, maybe single body, and they'll be very cheap to move in. And this is something that's congenial both to people who do quantum gravity and people who do quantum computing. In quantum computing, you don't expect to build a gate that couples 37 qubits together. Once we have a metric, we can talk about what's random, what's a random Hamiltonian. It depends on the metric because we draw randomly from some Gaussian. But the thing in the exponential of the Gaussian, it's very important what that inner product is. And I've written out in two different notations how the inner product depends on the metric. If you let the little h's be the coefficients of the Hermitian matrix in a fixed basis, then that's the index notation for the length squared of a Hermitian matrix for a given metric gij. And then the mathematician might write it the other way, the lower formula. And when I prepared the slide at first, I left out the inverse temperature. And then by the miracles of PowerPoint, I was able to add it last night in red. So I'll be discussing what I'd like to think of as metric crystallization. And the reason I call it that is because crystallization is a beautiful example of symmetry breaking. You have some homogeneous thing like chlorine and sodium and turns into a salt crystal and it crystallizes. And in this story, what we'll do is we'll start with a functional delta on metrics. And I write the functional as capital delta 
because I want you to kind of pretend it's an energy. Maybe it's sort of a pseudo energy. So this is a functional on metrics and I've drawn sort of a graphic of it. So that X axis that you see below, that's this enormous dimensional Lie algebra and sort of at its origin is this killing or adjoint invariant metric, but there's a huge space of other metrics. And this functional allows you to ask the question, well, what's a minimum metric? What, what's a local minimum metric? Minimum with respect to some pseudo energy delta. And then numerically, we'll try to fall into a minimum. And that was this incredibly heavy lifting that Shokri and Zinni did throughout this project. He ran a Microsoft cluster for two and a half years to uh, basically get the data that I'll show you bits of. Once you have the metric, you can produce a probability distribution, which is the Gaussian I had on the previous screen. And then you know what it means to take a random, given the temperature beta, given that probability distribution, that tells you what it means to take a random Hamiltonian. And our point of view philosophically is maybe that's the initial conditions for the universe. Some symmetry breaking at the start, a random Hamiltonian from a local minimum. And the local minimums is diagram there, uh, surprisingly often are interacting. They look like condensed matter physics or field theory, if you like, also. And I'll explain in about three slides exactly what I mean by an interacting metric and an interacting Hamiltonian. So first I wanna give you an example of an energy functional. You probably wondered, what in the heck, what, what are these functionals on metrics? Well, there's a very um, famous one that goes back more than a hundred years, which was very popular uh, among the crowd involving guys like Hilbert and Einstein, and that's scalar total scalar curvature. Now, if you have a homogeneous space like a Lie group, you only need to compute the scalar curvature at one point to know the total scalar curvature because it's the same at every point. And fixing the metric as I did at the Lie algebra, GIJ, tells you the left invariant geometry, the left invariant metric all over the curved group. So it does give a geometry. And these little sort of Feynman-like diagrams I drew here actually compute the scalar curvature. So the metric on the Lie algebra gives you Ramanian geometry on the Lie group. And by the miracles of mathematics, you can write down the formula in terms of the only two tensors that are in your hand. You have a two tensor, which is the metric, and you have the three tensor, which is the structure constants of the Lie algebra. So everything about the geometry must be some formula in those two tensors. And by looking at a beautiful paper of John Milner's from the mid seventies on left invariant metrics on Lie groups, it's not hard to figure out this diagrammatic notation. I think Milner did not know Feynman diagrams in those days or he would have written this in his paper because it's so lovely. But if you turn his formulas into diagrams, uh, that's what you get. So just in case you're not familiar, which I very much doubt, the vertices, the trivalent vertices are copies of the structure constants and the propagators in this picture are the metric or the inverse metric, depending on whether they're cups or caps. Now in this work, we actually found scalar uh, curvature to be rather difficult to work with numerically. Uh, it has a very flat landscape, actually. And we were only able to converge to local minimum of scalar curvature by cheating. We used the analytic literature in differential geometry to find certain uh, Einstein metrics, which uh, had been discovered by geometers. And we started the computer there and perturbed around them and verified that they were correct but we were never able to find uh, a reliable minimum by hunting and pecking and gradient descent. So we decided to consider other functionals and we followed the philosophy that any functional should have some kind of simple and reasonable expression in terms of those two tensors. So, yes? I wonder what you have the cubic term. The cubic is the... the oh, we, um, Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I understand in general, in general, you, you will run off to infinity, but we've arranged this functional to be uh, bounded. So you have additional terms. 
uh, well, the, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, let, let's address that afterwards. So, so I think because the time is limited in this talk, I won't like walk you through what we did exactly, but here's the spirit. We, I opened up um, a first year course in field theory and I looked at those integrals and I learned how to do um, quadratic, quartic and cubic perturbations. And then just um, copied what's done with polynomials with the tensors. So you could say that these are really technically Penrose diagrams rather than Feynman diagrams. And there are symmetry issues. If you, whether you regard the, the variables in the Lie algebra as either bosonic or fermionic, there's a problem that the structure constants are skew symmetric in two of the indices. And if you write down the very simplest thing, the cubic perturbation disappears by, on symmetry grounds. So we had to take three copies, that's what the three is under the integral, in order to uh, cook up something that was, um, that preserved the cubic term. So I think what I'm going to ask you to trust me is that an integral of this form, both the, with i and minus one, we considered both cases in the exponent. These are basically the simplest um, uh, perturbation formulas, formulas admitted uh, where you can admit perturbation theory and compute an integral that uh, will give you numerical access to some functional. So we just sort of did the simplest thing. And one of the things we learned is that the exact form of these integrals is not terribly important. And the way we learned that is by making mistakes. At the beginning, we had some wrong diagrams and we ran the computer and we found similar results. So even though we don't know this systematically, my very strong belief is you take some kind of ragged energy functional, you go find local minima, and uh, these local minima very often will have this interacting aspect. So let me make what interacting means precise. So now we're going back to this idea of a naked versus addressed Hilbert space. So on the right-hand side, you see C two to the N, and on the left-hand side, you see a qubit tensored up N times. So those are isomorphic, but the key is dressing the Hilbert space is choosing that isomorphism J, and there's many choices for that. And choosing that isomorphism capital J is equivalent actually to choosing an isomorphism on the Hermitian operators. One implies the other. And we say that a metric, Gij, on the Lie algebra is CAC. I wrote that down at the bottom. CAC stands for knows about qubits. If the metric has a basis of principal directions, principal with respect to the killing form, so that all the principal directions, which are written H sub K on the slide, are actually tensor factors. So under the little isomorphism J, the direction in the Lie algebra, which is principal, turns out not just to be a random direction, but a rank one tensor. It's directly the tensor with no sums of a Hermitian operator in each of the factors. So it's totally split. And this is a very strong condition because the Lie algebra, for example, in the simplest case, SU4 is 15 dimensional. And this means 15 principal directions all turn out to be uh, tensor decomposable. The next one we studied was SU8, that's 63 tensor directions. So it's, it's something that can't happen by coincidence. And numerically, roughly a quarter of the local minimum we found and studied turned out to have to high numerical precision, this kind of decomposition. So this was the first big surprise. And this is justifying the idea that the Hilbert space likes to dress itself. I want to give one other example. Uh, I mentioned the uh, scalar, sorry, I wanted to give, uh, I gave an example of the functional. I just want to make you comfortable with the idea of varying the metrics. And I want to give just two examples explicitly of different metrics we might be thinking of or starting with in the Lie algebra. So one of the metrics, is uh, just the most familiar killing metric, the L2 metric, and I wrote that at the top. 
And another metric to keep in mind, particularly for this audience, is what you might call the Nielsen Brown Suskin metric. And this is the metric that's diagonal on the poly word basis. So the poly matrix is XYZ are written down below, and they give the uh, basis for the Hermitian matrix two by two. If you want the n fold tensor power of those, you should take tensor products of one, x, y, and z. All ones is thrown out because it's not in the S. But the other ones have certain numbers of x, y, and z present, and the weight is the number of those letters. So roughly, you should say that those directions with n or k letters are the k body interaction directions, and the metric is diagonal, and the weight is e to the minus the weight. You can, you can choose the constant there. So in other words, you're exponentially penalized for being higher and higher body. So those are two metrics to keep in mind. Now, when we did the numerics, what we found was um, in SU4, for scalar curvature, we found only the ones that the mathematicians had found. And they both are CAC and correspond to subalgebra, uh, Lie algebra decompositions. For example, the six easy directions uh, correspond to the Lie algebra SO4 inside SU4. And in, the, in another local minimum, the easy directions is SP2 inside SU4. But we also found uh, other local minima, which are given by those strings of numbers. And those numbers add up to 15. And what they are is the degeneracy pattern. And they're listed from the smallest principal directions to the largest principal directions. And we sort of know what, know what they look like. And this is the numerics for SU8. Uh, again, we found some, uh, some of the things we found had to do with Lie algebra decompositions. Some were not related to Lie algebra decompositions. And in one interesting decomposition, uh, it was kind of a partial breaking into factors. Eight broke into four tensor two rather than two, two, two. And these two functionals I refer to are just details of that perturbed Gaussian integral. The one we nicknamed 2-4 is the Euclidean version with a minus sign instead of an I, and the 2-6 is with the I. And the numbers 2 and 6, that just reminds us of how many vertices in the Feynman diagram in the, uh, that we cut off our series at. A fascinating thing is we looked at this away from powers of 2, and it wasn't too surprising that at 6, we would see Q trit tensor Q bit. That, but what really surprised us is when we looked at seven and five, nature seemed to throw away a very thin slice, like, oh, I can't deal with that, and turn the number into composite, and then break it in the, the familiar way. So this kind of scared me, because, um, well, I thought of it as the leaky universe, which might be very hazardous, because it suggests that perhaps a very thin, thin, thin sliver of reality didn't organize itself into an, our interacting universe. And each of our wave functions may have some small overlap with this completely disorganized bit of primordial degrees of freedom. And if we happen to uh, get too much overlap with this, it could be unhealthy, I feel. So this is our, our leaky universe. Um, this was the second paper. By the way, you can find three papers are on the archive, and this is in the second. And the fourth will be there in a couple of weeks. Uh, and that's the one where uh, Adam Brown joined us. The third paper that's on the archive with uh, Moj and me, um, we decided to look at the um, Majorana version of the previous discussion. Instead of breaking into qubits, we ask whether local minima can be found that break into Majorat, products of Majoranas of homogeneous degree. So it's again the same criteria that to high numerical precision, the principal axes of the metric should point in homogeneous degree directions with respect to the gamma operators. And we find uh, solutions both in SU2 and SU8. Uh, of this kind that are Majorana, we had to seed them on my, on sort of Majorana solutions to find them numerically. But once we found them, the um, remarkable fact was that the norm squared of the uh, principal directions in, in some of these local minima 
obeyed the exponential scaling uh, that Brown and Susskind asked for. That's the formula. Gij is delta ij times e to the weight of the metric. So the analogous weight when you put in Majorana degree uh, in this in these diagrams we seeded the metric uh, on the blue curve, and then as the minimization proceeded numerically, the uh, <clears throat> uh, weight, the norm of these principal directions shifted around until they fell to some degree of precision on the red exponential. Okay, at this point in the collaboration, uh, Adam Brown made a fantastic suggestion when I was giving a talk somewhere. Uh, he was on Zoom. And he said, well, you're really only looking at half the picture if you're trying to understand the initial Hamiltonian of the universe. It's really a pair you should be looking at. You should be looking at the initial Hamiltonian comma, the initial state. So we thought this was a fantastic idea. And he further pointed out that there were mysteries that you know our universe is nearly 14 billion years old and entropy is still increasing. There's some kind of balance, if you believe in quantum mechanics, some kind of delicate balance between initial Hamiltonian and initial state that gives our universe with this slow production of entropy. So we wanted to see if we could learn anything about this numerically. And we did this by adding a source term to our original integral, that's the J. So J has to be put in here as a projector onto a state, but if you if you think of a state vector in the Hilbert space, that's like the initial state, you can e equally think of that as a rank one projector. And then it fits into this formula. Uh, you can integrate, uh, you can do the same integral. And now instead of having a quadratic and a cubic term, you have a quadratic, a cubic, and a linear term. So in this way, the minima are now, now if you go back in your mind to my first slide where the x-axis was the metrics, now we have a fatter x-axis. It's the Cartesian product of the metrics across all the possible initial states. We now have functionals like this on that bigger space, and we can look for their minima. And what we find is, <clears throat> well, we find that if we ignore the state and we just look at the uh, uh, operator, the Hamiltonian, we find that it still breaks up into uh, tensor decompositions uh, for its principal directions about a quarter of the time. Uh, but then we go and ask for the state, has it paid attention to that tensor decomposition? Does it line up? So this is SU2, uh, sorry, SU4. And the green graphic is we wanted a baseline statistic. So we just took 100,000 random vectors in C4 and we asked what the entropy was with respect to a random tensor decomposition. And we got this kind of slightly squashed uh, semicircle law. And then we looked at our um, 260, uh, sorry, 252 solutions we found. We found 252 different local minima by moving around different parameters of this functional. And we uh, asked what the entropy was with respect to the uh, CAC decomposition of the Hilbert space that that part had fallen into. And what you see is kind of a fluctuating background, but a huge zero entropy spike. So this means something very non-random is happening, that when you minimize the functional with the source term, the initial state is paying attention a lot of the time, 36 times out of 252, about 20 per, uh, 15% of the time, it's paying much, it's paying close attention to the uh, decomposition uh, that the Hamiltonian has found. And this is the same, this is the same story with uh, SU8. SU8, uh, the green again, is the distribution uh, for the entropy of a C2 versus this, uh, the entropy of a random vector with respect to a fixed two times four decomposition. And the blue is our evidence from uh, 260 some solutions that uh, that we found. And again, there's this large spike at zero entropy. So, oh, one uh, one final point about the uh, uh, about our investigations of SU8 is we actually found that the initial state never 
Foley wanted to respect the complete tensor decomposition into two, two, two. It, was, it would take one of the factors and pay attention to it and it would ignore the splitting of the, the four. And at first we thought, oh, this is lousy. We have to try and try and try. And we tried and we never found it to do this. And then we started thinking, actually, this is a really interesting thing because we're beginning to see the beginnings of an interaction lattice. We have three qubits and we're finding that two of them like to interact, the Hamiltonian likes to interact two of them. And it's not just that it wouldn't split, the resistance to splitting by statistical measures was much stronger than random. So not only do we see things that are split much more than you'd expect to happen randomly, when it came to asking for a final splitting of the state vector, it really didn't want to, it wanted to be entangling. So in, from state, stated from the Hamiltonian point of view, the Hamiltonian was not completely disentangled. It liked to have some interaction between two of the terms. And that relates to the last bullet point in my conclusions. So, so first, going back to the very beginning, I would say nature abhors a naked Hilbert space and likes to dress it in either a tensor or a Majorana structure. And we did see the brown Susskind uh, penalty metrics in a fermionic context. Uh, if you take a dimension not equal to the power of two, uh, the, the physics, numerics, whatever you want to call it, tends to throw out what we expect to be log many dimensions to make a small tensor decomposition. By the way, let me just tell you a beautiful number theoretic fact uh, that I learned from a number theorist here at Harvard. If you take just one prime, like two, uh, you have to wait a long time to be close to a power of two. But if you take two primes, like two and three, it turns out you're always very close to something that's a power of two times the power of three. You only have to move about log of your original number to get, Nor Noam Elkies showed me this. So things do break into these so-called smooth number. Everything's close to a smooth number. And this leads to this leaky universe fear. Uh, that some of the universe has not um, congealed into our tensor world, into our interacting world. Then the third bullet here is uh, the part I just described that uh, uh, Adam joined the collaboration. We added an initial state and we found that the state vector tended to line up very uh, in a very interesting way with the tensor decomposition. And we see in this, in the fact that we couldn't, that the state vector wouldn't completely line up in a triple factorization, the first glimmer of an interaction lattice. And in an earlier talk, Greg Moore said, well, why don't you try to connect with string theory? Why don't you consider like 10 to the 12th qubits and uh, see if you break into two body interactions and furthermore, the two body interactions are localized spatially. Maybe space can come out of this. Maybe each qubit only wants to interact with, um, what is it, 560,000 something. Who knows the kissing number for the leech lattice? But anyway, uh, that was his suggestion. Now, I plan to implement this on the computer, uh, but I'm going to take a break and do it in 100 years when we have uh, a quantum computer that can manipulate uh, 10 the 12th qubits, uh, you know, as you've seen, the numerics does not go very high. We couldn't really do much above eight. And this is because in dimension eight, the Lie algebra already has 2000 dimensions and the uh, evaluating the diagrams is extremely expensive. So you can't really do large numbers on a classical computer. But uh, if we all in this room are successful uh, in a hundred years, I'll be able to continue the investigation. And until then, I'm taking a break and think about other things. Thank you. Oh, you know, I never turned on my microphone. But I think this is <laughs> okay. So, uh, actually, just first uh, for questions, we have time. So, you need uh, please take a microphone for the audience which are online, and also please identify yourself. So. Uh, Yeah, I'm Xiaogang Wen, and uh, I have a simple question. So in this uh, CAG uh, uh, state, uh, 
do you mean this uh, the the metric became a tensor product of the metric in a smaller Hilbert space? No, no, it's not exactly that. Oh, I see. So what's that? What, it, so how do you identify the cat? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Let me just go back to the slide. Uh, oh, is that impossible? Uh, I see Arthur's face, but can I? Is there a way that I can show the slide to the audience and talk, speak to it? Is there a tech? Is there a tech person? Okay, so let me. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so here's the definition of CAC. You should focus on the red line that's in the middle of the screen. So it says that there um, exists the basis of principal vectors. The reason I say exists rather than the basis is because as you saw on those lists, there's some degeneracies. So you might have a three-dimensional subspace um, which has, uh, all equal uh, norm, and in that case, you have a freedom to choose within it. But what we what we say it's CAC if we can let just think of SU four if we can find fifteen principal uh, axes, each of which, uh, with respect to a fixed tensor decomposition, that axis is a tensor structure. So that's what it says: is J is the tensor decomposition, little J, and then. The 15 is um, one, uh, that's one K, K varying from one to four to the N minus one. So, you know, what it means very concretely is that if you look in that direction, so it's not the metric that's a tensor product, it's that in each of those 15 directions, if you look in that direction, the Hamiltonian is a, I don't know what you call that, a rank one tensor would be the math term. It's not a sum of things, it's just one tensor. Hi, Mike. Uh, this is uh, Sean Tsui. Um, just wondering uh, how how you chose the um, energy function on the matrix. Uh, like, why is it uh, nature given? Why the one you gave is? Yo, we're back here. Why did we choose that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I tried to explain. Um, the, the first thought was scalar curvature, and that uh, fit with some analytical results, but it did not prove convenient numerically. For one reason, scalar curvature does not have an expansion parameter in it. And in order to do the uh, sort of the machine learning and the gradient descents, there's a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ML in this. We needed to go to fairly small expansion parameters. So these constants like K, and uh, later on when we add the source term K sub J, those constants are, you know, like um, one or 2%, they're fairly small constants. So we needed to be able just to do, make the numeric stable, we needed to play, have a parameter family of functionals, not a single functional. And then the thought was, instead of just taking random combinations of diagrams, why not try to write down something that would look natural to a physicist, you know, a perturbed Gaussian integral, and just take the diagrams that came from that. So that was the thought, is try to do the, you know, just think what is the most natural functionals you can make from these two tensors. And having been educated in Feynman diagrams, this is what we did. So in, in the minimum, when you, when you look for the minimum, you uh, fix a K or do you fix or not? Yes, K is fixed. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Basically some preliminary study is done to find out which values of K are numerically convenient. And also in the formula on the screen, there's an I in front of the K. It turns out that um, many of the best results, the, for instance, the results I showed you at the end, that I is a minus one instead. Take, uh, for the time's sake, I think uh, let's thank Mike again. Uh, thank you.